You, know, you may not understand all that that song was implying, but it was letting you know that there was a time when we were not allowed to go into the presence of God. It was forbidden. But when Jesus Christ died on that cross, the Word of God says the veil was rent in the temple. That that separated the holy place from the holiest of holies, it was ripped, signifying that you and I now have an opportunity to experience when we want, when we want to be in His presence, we can go. And I love the words of that song, I ran into the throne room. I seen glory all around. I fell down on my face before you. Oh, how wonderful it is to go into the presence of the Almighty God. Amen, amen. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis, the book of beginning. It says this in verse 25 of the fourth chapter. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, she said, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And Seth, and to Seth, to him also there were born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. Interesting wording here. We're only barely four chapters in to the Bible, and we run across this statement. Then begin men to call upon the name of the Lord. And for just a little bit, I want to preach today. Learn to call on God. Learn to call on God. And with the dedication that took place today with all these beautiful babies, I was beginning to put things together and working on the message for this service, and I couldn't help but think about the process of raising kids. You know, I don't know that anybody's ever ready for them. Now, you, you think you do, right? Yeah, we, we think, we think, you know, you, you have, and a lot of times you have a conversation. Sometimes God just blesses you and they just show up. You know, we had one of those too. And God has a way of doing that. But usually you talk and you plan and things go and, and, and God chooses to bless. And, and you think you know, right? You, you think you know. Not only do you think you know, but you also know all the things that your kid's never going to do. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, my kid's never going to do that. Or, and I know that other people let their kids do this, but oh, how you learn to eat those words. Yeah, because my, my kid's never going to talk back, and my kid's never going to pitch a fit, and my kid's never going to beg for this. And Yeah. Now, how many of us will be willing to be honest here and say that we had a few of those thoughts? We may have never verbalized them, but we thought it, and then we paid the price. Yeah. It's interesting how, and this is my theory behind this, is God has a sense of humor. And, and nowhere is it more evident than when you have children. It's as if God's saying, you know, I know you had a lot of things you thought was going to work out. Then I wanted to give you this gift. Here you go. Have fun with that. And, 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 and all the things that you, you told yourself, I'm not going to be like mom and dad, I'm not going to do with that, and then all of a sudden in the moment, you find yourself awakening, hearing your father's voice come through your mouth or your mother's voice, whatever the case may be. It happens. God does that. Now, we're here. God trusts us. He gives us these beautiful babies to raise, and we do our part. And, and there's so many things to teach them along the way. Oh, my goodness. You remember the first baby? How many of you remember that first, first one you brought home? Now, we have three. So here's how it goes. The first one comes in, and, and everything, you sterilize, and you, you know, make everybody you wash themselves head to toe when they first come in. You can't touch the kid. Don't look at the kid. Don't breathe on the kid. Stand over there, and we'll show you. You know, because you don't want the kid to get sick. The second one comes along, you light it. By the time the third one comes, you're like, whatever, just pick it up off the floor. Whatever makes them happy. Just want them to be quiet. That's, that's the goal. If they're quiet, then there's peace in the house. The first baby comes along, and you take so many pictures. Everything they do is new. Every moment, every coup, every little thing. And you're just like, snap, snap, pictures this day. By the time the third one comes in, you have the picture of the day they were born and the picture when they graduate high school. In between was just a blur. They lived. They survived. You know, here you go. It doesn't mean you love them any less. It's just life has a way of trying to change some things out, and it, it's, it's a struggle. We're teaching them. We want them to learn stuff. So many great opportunities, so many things for them to know and for us to do. And I think for me, and I'm just speak for me, there also came that overwhelming sense of responsibility that, man, God has given me this child. I have a part to play, and hopefully I don't mess it up. I want to raise them right. 
I want to do the right things. I want to be sure that I'm there and I can help handle and, 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 and help them move forward. But there's one thing that I feel is so very important to teach our children. And it's the same thing that's so very important for you and I to also learn and practice. And that's learning to call on God. There's lots of stuff we want to teach them. There's lots of things that's very important in life. Lessons that are there. Opportunities to teach them what's right and what's wrong. Or skill sets they need to have that will help them move further in life. And things that, that you want them to master to, to put them ahead in this world. But I'm going to tell you the thing that is the best that you can teach your children that's going to far advance them more than anything else, more than any life skill, more than any, any, any money or monetary or things like that that will help them move forward in ways that you can't imagine. It's beyond anything believe, And that is teaching them how to call on God. Now, what's important about this teaching them to call on God is not just call on God when times are bad. But to have a kind of relationship with God that you also call on him when things are good. What do you mean by that, Pastor Kevin? I mean, when things are going good, that your first response is, praise God that that worked out. Thank you, Jesus, that you've blessed my life. Oh, God, you have been merciful for me again. God, you've showed up one more time in life. There's something about learning how to call on God because it doesn't matter the situation, whether it's good or bad. It doesn't matter what's coming your way or what storm you're facing. God continually says, call on me and I will answer you. He's asking for you and I to call on him. And what is seemingly could be just normal days and what could be abnormal days. No matter what it is affecting our planet or going on in our history, or our world, or our country, or our nation, God's desire is that we would learn how to call on him. This, this instance we have, I just read to you in Scripture, seems to be setting a pattern and a benchmark on having a relationship with God that if we will call on Him, God will answer us. When you don't know who to call, call God. When things are not going right, call God. When life is as good as it's ever been, call on God. Have a relationship with Him. We see this instance, and to me, it makes me kind of scratch my head a little bit. I, I may not completely understand all that was taking place but for to me I'm thinking I'm four chapters in why are we now just noticing that it was this instance that people begin to call on God what kind of dysfunction was taking place between Adam and his kids? Well, what, what fell apart along the way? It seems like this would have been, this would have been basic human relationships one-on-one -on -one as he was being blessed with his first children to say, hey, I want you to know how important it is to have a relationship with God, but we don't get that. Instead, it takes four chapters in, a few generations deep, and then Moses pins these words Men begin to call on the name of Lord. I look at the patriarchs, Abraham. He built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. Isaac built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. Jacob built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. Long before Moses was given the pattern for the tabernacle or the Ten Commandments or the law or the Old Testament pattern for worship and what we should do, men were calling on the name of the Lord. But in this instance, Cain and his descendants had become wicked. They had become self-sufficient and independent on their own from God. And we have to be careful here because we want our kids to be independent. We do that. It, it, it comes in. We want them, want them to learn how to, to crawl a little bit. We want them to eventually learn how to walk. And then we want to teach them words. We want them to talk, right? And then what we tell them to do, sit down and shut up. Well, they're just doing what you told them to do. You want them to move, you want them to go, you want them to, you want them to talk, and then, then all of a sudden you're like, quit moving and stop talking. Well, I'm confused. What's going on? Cain and his descendants, they became independent. And in this independence, worked iniquity. And they moved away from God. So God raised up godly seed in Seth, who had a son named Enos. And then, without any tools, without any methods, without any, any techniques, without a, without a choir and a band or any understanding, they didn't even have a copy of the Scriptures. It says men begin to call on the name of the Lord. There was a revelation that took place 
Somewhere inside of them, somewhere there was a self-awareness that I don't need to be doing this by myself. If I keep going down this road, it seems like it's pulling me further away from God. Maybe, maybe I should call out on the name of the Lord and just see what would happen if I did it. And when they did, God answered. God began to intervene in their situation in, in, in a way that only God can. I don't know everybody's circumstances and situations either in the room or who are listening online today. I, I, don't, I don't know all that you're going through. I don't know what you're facing in your life. But I have felt for some time in the churches, heard me preach about this quite a lot in the last few months, that God is trying to pull us back into a right relationship with him. What I, what I mean by that uh, is that we need to get back to where our default response, no matter what life brings us, is to call on God. We should have the kind of relationship that if something good is happening, the very first thing I want to do is to talk to God about it. And if something terrible is going on in my life, the very thing I want to do, my first response is to cry out to God. I feel like God's trying to bring us back into a right perspective and understanding of a relationship with him when Abraham went down to Egypt unwisely he ran back to the altar where he had first called on the name of the Lord we see this in Genesis chapter 13 verse number four it reads this way unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. That's what it needs to happen in your life and mine. If we drift away from God, we need to go back to the altar where we found him. We need to go back to the place where we know God meets us at. It, I don't know all that's going to go on, but I can, I can give you this with assurance that if you go to the altar, God meets you there. That's why it's important to have an altar in your life. You need to have a starting point. You need to have some place that you go back and remember where it was where God met you. I talked about last Sunday about having memorials in your life and how important it was to remember the goodness of God because life has a way of smacking you down. And sometimes you got to remind yourself that God's been faithful. God's been faithful in my life. God's been good to me in my life. Things may not be good right now, but God is still good. To go back to those beginning points, the, the word actually call that is used there means to cry out, to entreat, to, to, to beseech, to beg, to plead, to call out with your heart. That word later on as the Bible continues to move forward begins to develop another meaning. It comes into praise and to worship and to extol with your voice, to exalt, to honor, to celebrate Eventually, it goes to the point of saying that you should tell abroad to call out and to communicate with someone else the goodness that has happened to you. See, there's something about developing the relationship with God that moves beyond me. It's not just about me in the moment. We are such a, a me-centric world about me, have it my way, my way, uh, how it should be, how I think it ought to be, what makes me happy, what makes me feel good. But God calls us beyond that because that's such a, such a limited view of the world. We think it. It's right. We think it's what we want, but we get so entrapped. How many people do you and I know? And maybe there's even individuals in the room who would be honest enough to say, I know full well what you're saying, who have had everything that you've desired. Everything's gone your way. You've got the job you wanted, the education you wanted, the family you wanted, the house you wanted, the car you wanted. You've been able to do all these things and you find out that each with each one of those accomplishments, it's just empty on the other side because those things are nice and I'm not against you having stuff in your life. But if you're trying to find meaning and purpose in this life with buying or acquiring things, you're going to be miserable your entire life. Why? Because there's something bigger than just you. And it's what God has called you to be a part of in your life. But you're never going to figure out or understand what that is until you learn how to cry out to him and call out to God and let him lead you and guide you and direct you in your decisions and what you do each and every day. God doesn't want you to go haphazardly or go through life on cruise control, but his desire is to push you and to shape you and to form you and to make you into what? Into what he has desired for you to be from the beginning. We read the word of God and it says very plainly in you there that he had an expected end from your beginning. That means when he was forming you in your mother's womb, your mom and dad may not have expected you. They may have even considered you to be an accident, but not with God. He doesn't make accidents. He knew full well the moment you were conceived, he had a plan and a purpose for your life that was greater than anything you could ever imagine beyond your wildest dreams but you will never fully understand what that is until you move past yourself and you engage with him. And the only way you can engage with him is crying out. 
God, I am here. God, I am here. God, I need you. God, I desire for you to be in my life. I desire for you to lead me and guide me and direct me in the path that you have. But is that our prayer? Is that how we pray? Is it only about our needs and our wants? Do we ever just say, God, what do you want from me? What part, what role, what piece could I play? 1 Chronicles 4 and 10. It's the prayer of Jabez. A few years ago, it got really popular. There was books out about the prayer of Jabez. People had, you know, things that hung on the wall and throws on the back of the chair and clocks that all had the prayer of Jabez on there. It's like somebody all of a sudden discovered a little bit, of, a little secret in the scriptures that nobody knew about for so long. It's been there for thousands of years. So what happens when you read the Word of God. You find good stuff in there. It says this in 1 Chronicles 4 and 10. Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast, and that thy hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. How interesting is it that, that the response was God granted it? Do you, do you want to know why God granted it? Are you all ready for this? This is deep. You might need pen and paper. You might want to write it down. You ready? Here we go. Because he asked. Because he asked. God, would you just do this for me? God, would you help me? God, would you just bless me? Would you, would you enlarge what I'm trying to do? I don't pick up on a selfish spirit here. It's just, just Jabez saying, God, I just, I, just, I just want to do better. I want to be better. Could you help me here? And God's like, I can do that. It's just that simple. Living for God doesn't have to be hard. We make it hard. It doesn't have to be hard. Psalms 55 and 16, as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Deuteronomy 4 and 7, for what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. Psalms 18 and 3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Psalms 18 and 6, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of the temple, and my cry came before him even unto his ears. Psalms 86 and 5, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Psalms 86 and 7, In the day of my troubles, I will call. Why do I keep giving you so many scriptures? Is because I want you to know there's a pattern there to call upon God, to call on him in the good times and to call him in in the bad, to call him in when things are going well and to call him in when there's distress and there's pressure and anxiety and things are not going the way you want them to, when things are out of your control and you know that it shouldn't be this way, but yet it is, still call on God. So who are the godly? You want to know who the godly are? are? Those who call upon him. David said, you can do anything you want to me. He gave God just, whatever you want to do, God, I'm okay with. He was known as the man after God's own heart. He was saying, God, if you need to fight against me sometimes, then fight against me. If you need to talk about me, persecute me. But, but look, God, I'm still going to call on you. There's something about having that mindset of, God, I may not know it all, but I know you do. I may not under, understand every circumstance, but I know you do. I may not, may not understand why things are going a certain way in my life, but I know you have a reason and a purpose behind everything that goes on. And my job is to learn to call on you. My job is to be dependent. My job is to trust and let you work the details out. Let you sort it out. Not just blindly going through. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a trust in God, no matter what news you get no matter in the circumstances you face, that God is going to take care of you. And that kind of a relationship only comes from someone who has learned to cry out to God. Who are the ungodly? Well, the very definition of evildoers in the Scriptures is those who don't call on the name of the Lord. We need to learn the process of calling on the Lord. We need to teach our children to call on the Lord. Psalms 116 and 2 says, Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. Psalms 118 and 5, I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Psalms 14 and 4, having all the workers of iniquity, you know, knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord. 
Why would you not be someone who, who calls out to God? What do you have to lose in calling out to him? Why would you wait so long? Why would you not want to talk with him on a regular basis and have the kind of relationship where he truly is a friend? He's a part of your everyday life and the decisions you're making. Why would you shun him or walk away? Why would you, why would you decide that God's no longer to be a part of your life? Why? Just because things didn't go your way for a moment? You, God abandoned you for some reason? Is that truly what you think in your heart of hearts? Why would God do that? The word of God says that God is good and that God is love, that God knows what it is that you need more than you know what it is that you need. God's ways are above your ways, and God does not have to give you an explanation for why things take place. It's for you and I to determine that he is good, that God is always good, no matter what comes away, that God is good. So I, there are some things that I just don't have control of in this life. I can't control the weather. I wish I could. I'd make it a little cooler. I, I can't control the seasons. I can't control the politics. I can't control, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's out of my control. But so many people miss out and have a relationship with God that is destroyed because they keep trying to control things that they were never intended to control. The truth of the matter is God's only asked you to control one thing, and that's you. You can control you. There's everybody else outside of you, you can't control. You can try to manipulate, you can try to do other. But every time you do that, you're trying to play the role of God. There's only one God. There's only one God. And he does a real good job at being God. Everything else is not God. So why don't you be who he wants you to be and quit worrying about the stuff that's outside of your control. Learn how to cry out to him, have a relationship with him. Quit making excuses and just pray. God draws you near when you call on him. You may be in the worst trouble you can imagine. You may have messed up in your life. You may have backslid in your relationship with God. But the moment you call him, he's there. The moment. The moment you cry out to him, he's there. He meets you. It doesn't matter your failures. It doesn't matter your circumstances. It doesn't matter how far you've slid down. The moment you stand back up, you're on the right path. Whoo. He tai the moment you stand up, Sister Kennedy, the moment, I don't care how much you've been knocked down, I don't care how far you've fallen, the moment you stand up, you're on victory's path. You're on victory's path. That moment, oh, you may not be all the way back where you should be, but you're on victory's path. That moment, oh, rejoice not against me, oh, my enemy, for when I fall... I shall arise. Oh, I love that word because it means sometimes I stub my toe and sometimes I fall down. And when I do, don't you dare laugh at me, devil, because I'm going to get back up. You haven't won. I still got breath. I still got the ability. I'm going to go to the house of God and there's still a chance. You cry out and he will meet you there. Isaiah 64 and 6 says, but we are all as unclean things. Now, all of our righteousness are filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that call upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from among us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Psalms 145 and 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that call upon him. The Lord is close. Ladies and gentlemen, why would you not call upon him? Because the moment you do, whoo, he moves into where you are. Oh, you may feel like you're a thousand miles away. You may feel like you're standing at the very gates of hell. But I promise you, in your darkest moment, call on God because he is close to you in that moment. Amen. What is required? Calling on God, that's what's required. People in the world will do a lot of good things, but they will not humble themselves. They will not recognize God's lordship over their lives, and they will not call on his name. And to do so is to be so far away from him. But that is not the way it's supposed to be with us. Not with you and I. No, no, we're supposed to be close to God. We're supposed to cry out to him. We're supposed to be near him. Isaiah 55 and 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you what, if you're not prepared for the end, whew, you make me nervous. You make me nervous. Why would you want to stay in this world? Oh, why would a child of God want to be here? Why? Is there not something inside of you that says, Lord, I'm ready to go home? I preached about it about a month ago when I said, it's something inside of me. Never in my life have I prayed with such fervency. Lord, come quickly. 
Come quickly. Come quickly. Isn't that selfish, Pastor Kevin? Why are you doing? There's so many people out there. I, I, I'm not trying to pray from a selfish perspective. I'm praying that I tro- my soul is so troubled down deep inside that, God, I want you to come back. I want to be with you. I know you give me a book full of promises that are there, and I stand on your word. God, I see how things are lining up, and I know your soon returning is coming. Oh, we've been hearing that our whole lives. Yes, we have been hearing that our whole lives, but we're closer than we've ever been. We're closer than we've ever been. I refuse to sit on the sidelines and just preach a happy message about grace and mercy. I'm thankful for all those things in my life. But I'm here to tell you, hell is real. 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 It is a real place. And you better do your part. You may try to disagree with me and say that's just some folk or fable tale. But I'm telling you the word of God is true. It is all true. It's either all true or it's all wrong. You can't take a piece or a portion or just the things that make you feel good for just a moment. You better understand that Jesus Christ himself talked about hell and how it was a real place and how he went to prepare a place for you and I. But we have to do our part to stay in agreement with him to be in that covenant relationship. Yes, he died on Calvary for each and every man, woman, and child that has ever been breathe, but we have an obligation to not only receive it, but live it. Oh, I'm sure somebody will preach you a happier message across the street, but I'm going to preach you truth. I've told you that I gave you my promise over six years ago. I'll never stand in this pulpit and preach you anything but truth. And the truth of the matter is this. We are called not only to receive his spirit, but to live with that spirit the way God wants us to live. And there are some things you're just going to have to make up your mind. I'm not going to do in this world. Learn to call out on him. The enemy's entire strategy is to deceive the human race. For 6,000 plus years, he said, don't cry out. Be clever, be organized, plan a lot, depend on talent and technology, but whatever you do, don't cry out to God. The devil is not the least bit afraid of our best human efforts. But what he gets scared of is when we lift up our hands and our hearts and we begin to cry out in the name of the Lord in a united effort. There's something about when we get together and we understand that there is power when we unify in our worship and our praise. There's power when we come together and say that there is one God. His name is Jesus. There is power when we come together and say that there is a life he's called each and every one of us to, a life of separation and dedication unto him. This world's not about making me happy. It's about me understanding my place in the kingdom that I have a role to play. Psalms 15 and 15, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. It has always been the sign of God's people that they call on the Lord and he answers. But all bets are off if we don't call. All bets are off if we don't call out to him. There's not a promise in the Bible that works if we don't call on the Lord. This is the way the Old Testament prophets operated. You remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal? Remember he goes in before him? He's all that out there. Everything's playing out. Big story. I'm not going into all the details. Not only does it matter that you call, but it matters who you call on. What proved that God was God? It proved that it was, that it was the way Elisha called him. Here's the, here I'm gonna give you, here, here's the Bible's best definition of revival. Psalms 80 verse 18. So we will not go back from thee. Quicken us and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord, God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. Why? Because we called out. And when I called out, he turned his face. So many scriptures in the Psalms, and talk about don't hide your face from me. Don't turn your face. Why? There's something about when he turns on us. You can feel his glory, and you can feel his presence. The psalmist knew this, and, and it was right. And several of these were written by David. David found himself in trouble all the time, and he learned to cry out to God in his distresses and his trouble. Why? Because God always showed up and delivered him. Each time it was a faith builder in his life that God's going to be faithful again and again and again and again. I'm not going to re-preach two Sundays ago, but God is faithful. Two Wednesday nights ago, God is faithful. God is good. God is always good. Always. Even when things are not going the way I want them to go, guess what? God is still good. 1 Kings 18, 24. And ye call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. If we're not calling on the name of the Lord, it's not revival. I don't care what you're doing. 
Whatever you do in word and deed, you do it all in the name. Revival happens when you and I, we get sick of the status quo and we call on his name. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of prayer. When we have him in our hearts, we will call on the name of the Lord continuously. I've been feeling, and you know this, for God to call us back to prayer. I'm so thankful for the ones who come up here during the week. So many of you are coming during the week and the prayer room is being used. I'm thankful for the three individuals that showed up early this morning in the prayer room were there. Thank you for taking the time. You're, you're, you're spending time out of you unselfishly to come and pray. It, 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 it changes the course of this church when we become a church of prayer. When we understand that, that, that I have to have prayer in my life. When we understand the importance, that's why that we're going back and instituting 24-hour prayer chains. Starting tomorrow at 6 a.m., there's a 24-hour prayer chain that's going to take place in our prayer room. The, all of the shifts are filled at this point, but I want you to know, if you didn't get a prayer shift, it's okay. Just come. You can still come to the prayer room anytime you want to. We were just making sure that we had continuous prayer for 24 hours in that day. So tomorrow is a day of prayer, and it's a day of fasting. Why? Because it gets us to where we need to be. We're living in the hour. We don't need to be playing patty cake for Jesus. We don't need to be just sitting on the sidelines. But it's time. It's a high time for us to activate the very things God's given us to activate. It's time to be living the life, not just pretending, not just having a, a little casual relationship, but being bought out completely, sold out 100%. I'm in this, God. Whatever you want us to do, I want to do it. I know full well we have a city God has called us to reach. We have a region that we have influence in. But the only way we're going to effectively do it is when we get back to praying, when we get back to fasting, when we get back to calling on the name of the Lord. Why? Because there's power in that. Prayer is better caught than taught. Revival is better caught than taught. Evangelism is better caught than taught. Those things only happen when you call on the name of the Lord. God will not adapt himself to our culture, ladies and gentlemen. He will not adapt himself to our customs or our comfort zones. We still have to call on the name of the Lord. doesn't matter what's going on in the world around us. We have to know what thus saith the word of God and apply that in our life. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. There it is. There's a prophet. Each one of you, I talked about it earlier when I was talking about these children as we were dedicating them, each one of them have an expected end that God had planned just for them. And moms and dads, it's your job to pray it in their life. You hear me, moms and dads? It's your job to pray it into existence in their life. God's already planned it there. Psalms 4 and 3 says, But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. God's desire is for, for, for you and I to have fresh praise in our life. Don't come into the house of God with, with just a mindset to go through the motions. Don't come in just because the song's familiar, you can sing it with your, you know, and I have to look up the screen. But do you know the words? I'm using it in the intimate way the King James says. Do you know the words? Are they a part of your life. There's something different when you sing it because it's affected you. It's something different when you're really praising and you're engaging in those songs. And, and if that's the case, it doesn't matter. You don't have to have a piano or a guitar or a keyboard or a set of drums. There's, you, could, you could be singing the old rugged cross and there's a praise that comes up inside of you. Why? Because you're connecting with the words that you're singing. You're connecting to who? You're connecting to Him. That's what worship is about. It's putting us down and lifting Him up. God wants that fresh praise. The church was born in a prayer meeting. Its power is in that prayer meeting. God still desires it. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God desires for you and I to call on his name. I'm wondering, does it bother anybody anymore? The church was born in a prayer meeting, but prayer meetings seem to be the worst attended event on the church calendar. Does it bother anybody? Does it bother anybody that his way of showing up and pouring his spirit out was in a prayer meeting? I don't, I'm not trying to, to necessarily guilt you, but are you praying? They didn't have prayer in the first century Roman schools. But the church called on the name of the Lord. 
I know there are ladies and gentlemen and parents in this, in this room right today. They're upset because they don't allow prayer in schools, but they never bring their kids to prayer meeting. The political figures in the first century were more corrupt than anything we could imagine today. More corrupt. Go back and read your history. I know we're ashamed, and we should be ashamed of what's going on in our country today. It's sad and sickening. But ladies and gentlemen, this is something new. There's nothing new under the sun. This was going on long ago, and even more deviant and worse than what you and I are facing there. But the church still moved forward. Why? Because they learned to call on the name of the Lord. They refused to be pushed into a corner. Instead, they said, the harder you come after us, the harder we're going to pray. You think you're going to push us down? You think you're going to beat us? You think you're just going to kill us? You think you're going to do all those things? No. Instead, they turned it into deeper and longer prayer meetings, and it changed the course of history. Why? Because not even hell can stop the power of prayer. As I bring this to a close today, we all blame life. We, bring, we blame and bring in all these external situations and excuses for our problems. We like to divert the attention away from our weak prayer lives. There's no worry about the world in the pages of the New Testament. The church was commissioned to change the world. To change. They couldn't control the external circumstances, but they could control themselves. They had the ability inside themselves to grab a hold of God and hang on. And by doing so, they changed the course of history. How? Through prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, through prayer. If you're not happy with what's going on right now, if you're not happy with what we're facing and all that's going on that seems to spin out of control, I'm asking you this question. How much have you prayed about it? So much time is being put into to griping and complaining and posting and, and rebuttaling each other on social media pages. How much time have you spent in prayer? How much time have you really spent on your face saying, God, we need you. God, I need you. God, our nation needs you, Lord. How much time have you spent in prayer calling out to God? God is not interested in your excuse or mine. All he wants to know is, are you going to continue the long line of people calling out my name? Do you long to see the church move forward? Do you long? I'm, I'm, I'm really asking you, just, just don't give me a nod because you feel like it's the right thing to do. I'm asking you to think about this question. Do you really hunger and thirst for that latter revival? And if you do, what price are you willing to pay because it will come 